Hey, what's got four walls and goes pop? A pop-up store, of course. And I reckon maybe, just maybe, you should have one. Well, I said, welcome to a small business marketing show where successful small business owners share their souls to take your marketing straight to the lead. Now, here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. And welcome back, listeners, to another episode of Australia's number one marketing show. I'm your host, Timbo Reed, you right there. You're a motivated business owner. Yeah. Yeah, you're ready to build that baby of yours into the empire it deserves to be. And that's exactly what we do around here. Hey, big show today. We are joined by Melbourne's pop-up store queen. At least that's what I'm going to call her. Her name's Nicolina Sarek. Very interesting interview. One we haven't had before on the show, all about pop-up stores. Inspirational feedback from a listener I have for you. And wait for it, (laughs) a motivational marketing quote from that wonderful Italian marketer, Michelangelo. Yeah, 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 the artist. (laughs) Hey, uh, today's show lovingly brought to you by the key person of Influence People, the world's leading business accelerator program for those wanting to become an industry thought leader, just like you. And if you want a copy of their free hardcover book. It's a ripper. I'm going to tell you more about that later. Head over to keypersonofinfluence.com forward slash Timbo and they will post it to you in the mail, the snail mail. And we're also brought to you by the good folks at Audible. You want another free book? Yeah, an audio book this time. Head over to audibletrial.com forward slash SBBM. As per usual, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Do you need a speaker for your next conference? Recommend Timbo to your event organiser. Or better still, book him. Tim Reid. That's R-E-I-D dot com dot A-U. Hey, before we get stuck into today's guest, a little check-in. How's your week? How's your month? How's your business? Hope it's going really well. Really well. If it's not... I'm glad you're listening because there will be ideas in here and in past shows, like 279 past shows, to uh, go back to and seek ideas and inspiration from. I mentioned last episode, if you go to iTunes and leave a listener review with a question in it for me to answer on the show, I will do that and leave your Twitter handle and... um, and your website address, so I can give you a bit of exposure along the way. Thank you to uh, Bobby Barnden and Akrudu and Ronsley. I'm more on Ronsley in a minute. Those three people did leave a review. They didn't leave a question, though, for me to answer, but they did leave a review on iTunes. Thank you for that. Hey, um, speaking of Ronsley, he is organising the We Are Podcast Conference, the inaugural Australian Podcasting Conference, which starts this Saturday on the Gold Coast, and I'm speaking at it. And Ronsley very kindly left me a review. He has a wonderful podcast called Bond Appetit. Um, what else this week? Oh, one of my four, two forum members, they hit me up about the poor quality of the audio on last week's, on the last episode. I actually did that out of my car. I know, normally it's pretty good, but I used an old microphone. Yeah, whatever. I'm just, I've moved house. I'm trying to figure out the acoustics of my new room. Hopefully this is sounding a little bit better. Uh, But all in all, it has been a good week. I'm settled into the new house and I'm ready to bring you some marketing. G-O-L-D. So let's get stuck into it. So today's guest is Nicolina Sarek. Uh, She has a business called buildbrand.com.au, but I have labelled her Melbourne's pop-up store queen for good reason. She's nailing pop-up stores, absolutely. I met her on a recent educational tour that I went on with the National Online Retailers Association, got talking to her over a burger uh, at the Honey Bar, actually, uh, and uh, I thought, I need to interview you. I think us us small business owners need to find out more about pop-up stores. She is highly passionate about them, and um, as you'll discover... I think pop-up stores are suited to all types of businesses, not just necessarily those trying to offload some cheap clothes, which maybe that's the impression people have about them, but I think they may be suitable to even your business. Let's find out. I started off by asking Nicolina to describe a time where she took a huge leap of faith. 
Probably the first time would have been my first pop-up store. Um, I, I knew I had an idea. I'd spoken to a lot of suppliers. I went and had a look at a lot of spaces. But when I actually made, really made the decision to actually do it, that was probably my, my biggest one because I just didn't know what was going to happen because I'd never done it before. I love uh, those moments when you, a business owner, a business person goes, you know what? I'm going to do this. Why was it a leap of faith for you? Yeah. Well, for me, it was so unknown. It was so uncomfortable. Um, it was a very uncomfortable feeling. I, I guess I had a vision of what it was going to be, um, and but I didn't exactly know how it was going to turn out. So I guess it's about letting go of that control and um, just... So the, uncomf- the, the uncomfortableness, what, what, what do you mean by that? You know, it, I guess it's like, you know, getting, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah. You know, I, I did something that I've never done before. It's kind of like jumping out of a plane when you have to sort of step over the line or, um, you know, just, you know, fa- facing, was, I guess facing a bit of that fear. I'm sure every every small business owner has got exactly this. It's resonating hugely with them. They've all got a similar story. And and yeah. for you, what what were you letting go of? I guess that I might fail or that I might succeed or that I might, you know, it's like, you know, I just had to let go of what was going to happen. What? I just had to get in there and, and, and you know, give it, give it a crack. What was the downside? Like, what if you, what if you failed? Well, there was no downside really because my first store, I'd set it up so that it, it was, you know, aiming to win, but worst case scenario, it, it wasn't a huge, there was no huge risk. Right. So for me, it might have been, you know, trust or it might have been, but it, there was never, a, there was never, there was never um, a negative to, to, to trying it, definitely. Did you feel like there were a lot of people watching or was it just you putting, uh, uh, pressure on yourself. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, at the time, I was like, there's all these people. What? No one, no one was watching. No one was watching. There was obviously the suppliers that I was working with. You know, they they had an intention um, that they wanted to um, to you know get to. Um, but at the same time, they were focusing on their things. What they yeah, were right. focusing on. It's like you know, and and it is. It's like. I I did think maybe everyone was watching, but no one was really watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't me. that funny? Isn't that funny? Yeah. We think the whole world's watching <laughs> and it's like, yeah. you know, even doing an interview like this, you know, it's just you and me just having a no, chat. No, no. But you just, there's a sense of like, oh, yeah, yeah, there's not a person around that's not listening into this. But yeah, it's like, it's like it, oh, my God, everyone's <laughs> going to be Googling me. Everyone's going to be standing outside watching what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You fuck up. Yeah, it's like, yeah. yeah. So, so. so take me, take us back to before you did, before you jumped and made that leap of faith, what were yeah. you doing? So I was actually um, in a like an entrepreneurial group. So I was working with a, a business mentor. I knew I had a bit of a an idea of what I wanted to do. I had been working in a um, as a brand manager um, in a in a business, a really good, great little small business called Eco Soul Life. And you know we helped. What, what was it called? Eco Soul Life. So they do biodegradable tableware, cups, plates. Yeah, right. And I was I was a brand manager there, and you know it was amazing to actually see it grow from you know, a husband and wife team yep. to now they've got it in like over 10, 15 countries all over the world. So, and were you not also, a? why did I think you were a buyer for like a Kathmandu or something? Yeah. So previous to that, I was a buyer for Anaconda for five years. Yeah, right. Yeah. And is that yeah. where you saw the opportunity, just for, for overseas listeners, Anaconda, outdoor gear, yeah, camping and outdoor yeah. gear. Is that where you saw the opportunity for a pop-up? Oh, no, I actually didn't see the opportunity for a pop-up until six months before I did one. But I think it was all a part of the process. Anaconda, I was there for five years, an outdoor adventure store. I was in there buying, you know, clothing and footwear, developing our own product, creating retail spaces, creating a story for the customers and, you know, creating that wow factor. Right. You know, and I've always been in retail. Previous to that, I was at Target for five years. And, you know, it's, it's, I think it's all just a part of the process. Everything that you learn along the way, you yep. learn to get to where you are right now. Like sometimes you don't know. Where did you identify the problem that the pop up was going to solve? Like where was what, where was that moment? So I started a business when I left when I left Ecosol Life. I started my own business running product development and brand identity, working with 
See, with some of these brands that I'm working with now to run their product development, but I wasn't really solving a big enough problem and I really wanted to help the industry. So I, I asked them what are their biggest problems. So I called as many as I could and I asked them what are some of your biggest problems and some of your biggest barriers of growth right now. Great and question. That deserves a yeah, round of re- applause, that one. Yeah, and, and it really gave me my business, you know, really finding out what my clients want. Okay, let's just – I've got, I've got to stop you there, and I, we, we all need to understand this because that's just, just, just such a good question. So you've gone to your industry contacts whose opinion you respected yeah. and said, yeah. what is the biggest problem you have right now? Is that, was that the question? Yeah, that's right. And did you put a context around that? Was it around stock? Was it around marketing? Was it around finance? Or was it just a general no. question? It was a general question. So, you know, I guess it was around, yeah, what's stopping you from growing your business? You oh, know, what wow. are some of your biggest barriers and some of your biggest problems? Okay. And? And they tell, and they tell you. And it's like there was a pattern. So I surveyed a whole bunch of brands and I said it was, you know, cash flow or excess stock at the end of the season. We don't know what to do with it. And, you know, we sell through. But it's like, and I, but I know in the industry, sell through is that's actually, that's always going to happen. So, and that's where I saw a gap. I'm like, okay, well, that's a trend. The trend is that there's always going to be a sell through rate of, say, 70% when you bring in a new line. There's always. What do you mean sell through? Like, so, say, for example, if you buy a thousand units of a product, you might get, um, you might sell seven seven hundred units um, in say the, the period in which mm-hmm. you intend to sell it. There's always going to be bits and pieces left over. Yep. You know, Excess to get a hundred percent sell through. Yeah, to get a hundred percent sell through, you're either not buying enough, or you're underpricing it, or or it's a really awesome product and you want to reorder more really quickly, yep. which doesn't happen that often. But um, it's. Yeah, so it's it's always going to happen. You're always going to have bits and pieces left over. So excess stock isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's actually just a part of business. This is the stuff that you find in the bargain bins in, in you know, in store. That's right. Right. So, um, like, in a retail space, they have a clearance strategy. So you go to Anaconda and they sell something at full price and then they sell something at off price and then they've got a clearance section and, um, and then they totally move it out. But for a lot of these brands, they don't have a clearance strategy. They just want to grow their brand and sell it. And, but at the same time, they don't necessarily want to cannibalize their other products by taking 50% off something they've just sold to their clients, mm. you know, six months ago at, at full price. So we take away that. We, take, we took that away from them. Wow. Nicolina, this must have been a great moment because basically they've said we've got all this excess stock. You in your yeah. previous jobs have been about creating wow factors, about creating retail spaces, about creating customer experiences. Here's a whole bunch yeah. of businesses saying, here's some stock. If you can get rid of it, you can keep <laughs> some of the money. Go and practice, yeah. your, go and practice your craft. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. Really exciting. Because I knew that I could turn it into cash, but I also knew that I could still create that wow factor. People coming to the store, you know, merchandising it in a, in a, in a way, still representing the brand and making the yes. brand stand out and, you know, showcasing it in a way that it, you know, shows customers, oh, look, look what this brand's about. They're an Australian brand. They're based out of Melbourne. This is what they're doing. So it creates exposure, but it also means they, that customers get to experience that product for the first time and they get to buy it at off price, which, custom, you know, client customers love. Yep. But, yeah, it's in a retail space and we're there for a, a short period of time. What experience or knowledge did you have around this pop-up store thingamajig? Um, I guess I, I had done, you know, I'd, I'd set up stores before, but I'd never really set up a short-term um, before. So it was really just about going out and asking, speaking to a lot of um, um, leasing agencies, um, going to a lot of shopping centres and speaking to, you know, the casual casual leasing people. And there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of people out there that look after just casual leasing of, you know, certain areas. So right. just getting an understanding of how that works and, and also speaking to other people in the industry that have already done it. W- were there many? Um, yeah, there's a couple of people out there that had been doing pop-ups previously or had been doing certain things like it. So just really asking them um, a bit about it. Um, there's also a great, um, in, South, in the South Melbourne market, there's a great 
um, little project called So Me Space where you can go in for a short period of time mm. and, you know, showcase a range show. I guess I did a mini version of that. And it was – so it basically it, – it's there's a lot of little examples of um, – of, you know, what I looked at yep. to sort of get a bit of an idea of how, how it can work. One of the things that's striking me with you, Nicolina, is that you're not scared to ask. You get out there, oh. you, you roll the <laughs> sleeves up. You've got to ask. You've got, got to ask. ask. I, it's a recurring theme amongst a lot of my <laughs> guests. They've just got, you know, if you don't ask, you don't get. If you don't ask, you don't know. Uh, why Why die trying, you know? Um, yeah, and people love it. People in the industry want to help you. And, and when they see that there's someone excited about something, they're like, yeah, we should do this and come back any time. Let's go for a coffee and I'll help you. And, hmm. yeah, they, people love helping people. I, I no. honestly, there's uh, listeners. If you are thinking about doing something, go and ask someone because it, nine out of ten Definitely. times they're gonna they're gonna make some time for you or at least say you know give you some advice. Um, so you have gone in, you've started. Let, let's talk. So we haven't talked pop up stores before on the show. So um, how how do you actually define a pop up store, and what's the process from going? I've got a whole lot of stock to actually opening the doors. Um, I guess to define a pop-up store, it's usually um, uh, going into an empty space for a short period of time, um, and it's usually from like, it could be anywhere from like four days to three months. Um, so you're there, and it's usually you want to be in a, in a high traffic area where people are passing by, because then it becomes, a, 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 it's, that's a part of your marketing, the location's a part of your marketing. Yeah. Um, so once you've got that, then, okay, so what am I going to put in the store? So it's like, what's the range going to look like? So, you know, collaboration of a whole bunch of brands. Okay, well, you know, what's the stock going to look like? Um, these are the dates that we need the stock here. And my first store was probably, um, you know, a really good example. You know, we had, a, we had dates when everything needed to be delivered. Um, we got the keys on a certain day. Got all the stock delivered, all of our um, fixtures and fitting. We, we kept it really simple. You know, we, we use rolly wraps, we use um, plywood from Bunnings using milk crates and, um, yeah, and that's, that's basically it. Um, and we, we basically set up the store with that. So keeping it, keeping it really simple and light, easy to move around has definitely been um, a benefit for us. Hey, we'll be back shortly to continue the discussion with pop-up store queen Nicolina Sarek. Hope you're enjoying it, by the way. But I just wanted to read an email I got from a listener who has recently read the Key Person of Influence book, and they did it before bed. I told them not to do it before bed. It's from Ken Lloyd. He says, hey, Timbo, I'm writing because you recently asked if anyone had read the Key Person of Influence book that they should drop you a line and share their experience. Well, here I am. I recently received the book and have read through it. Unfortunately, I read it before bed. Be up all night, Ken. And yep, there were quite a few late nights where I was inspired and writing down ideas. I'm now reading the book for a second time and completing the exercises around the five Ps. Um, what they do is they have a five-step process, guys, for helping you become a key person of influence in your industry. Profile, publishing, um, productizing, partnerships, and pitching are the five Ps. And if you nail them, you will be a KPI. If you want to grab a copy of the book, head over to keypersonofinfluence.com forward slash Timbo, and they will post you a hard copy of it in the snail mail. Amazing. Enough of that. Let's get back to the queen of pop up stores. I mean, do you create a brand around the store or do you let the brands that you sell do the talking? We do, I guess, a bit of both. So we, depending on the location and where we're at and what the, what the demographic wants. Um, so say, for example, if you're in an area where people love the brands, so okay, so it's all about grouping the brands together and, you know, you know, putting a sign above the brand, say, the upside, and, you know, this is what the upside are about and really showcasing it away in a way that it looks wow. Like people walk in, it's like, I love that brand. I love what that brand's about. Um, and, and the colours all work together. So the great thing about telling the brand story is that usually within the, within the season, it's like they've told a colour story, so it looks fantastic when it's merchandised all together. Yeah, right. So that tells its own story. 
for sure. I, I imagine you wouldn't be able to, like, if you're, because you specialise in fit, the fitness industry, your fitness clothing for women. So yeah. I was just going to say, I, I imagine, like, if you're, say, stocking Nike and Adidas and whatever other brands there are, you know, like, you couldn't ask for their posters and signage. I mean, you, you couldn't, you couldn't um, pass off as being one of their stores, could you? Well, well, you can have um, signage within certain sections, and I've done that before, and that works really well. Hmm. But at the same time, you don't necessarily want to o- overload it. And because I have niched, and that's um, one of the other things that have really worked well for me, we've niched into fitness apparel. So we're telling a fitness apparel story. So you walk in, um, so we might have we might have brand stories on the side of the walls, but you walk in and you might have a whole bunch of full-length leggings. So we'll tell a full-length legging story. Yeah, right. Then we'll tell a T-shirt story. Tell me about telling a story. I hear I hear this phrase in fashion. It's <laughs> such a it's such yeah. a great story, darling. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's this idea of the legging? Tell me about the legging story. And does it have a happy ending? It does. <laughs> Leggings always have a happy ending. <laughs> I'm not even going there. Yeah, but, but, what, what is the story? Because I, I think this is something probably can apply to other businesses. Yeah. Okay. So I guess it's about um, – It's a lot, a lot of it has got to do with, I guess, trends as well. So when you walk into – even to a store like Zara, you walk into the store and it's like, okay, it's first thing. You, what's the first thing you see when you walk into that door? So it's like, okay, well, at the moment it's all about white. So it's going to be – you know, white jeans with white with the white top. There's a story with, right know, there. Um, there's, there's a story right there, and then you've got a mannequin that sits next to it with a poster behind it with a with a you know with a feel and look and feel of where you would actually wear that outfit. Right. So, and we we try and do that in our store by you know doing say maybe a, a full table of leggings with um with you know a, a mannequin behind it dressed. In you know something that might actually um, look re- look really well, sit back really well with, mm-hmm. with say a pair of your tights. Then we've got like a little candle with a little Buddha ah. and a little postcard with inspiring images. So it's all about you know getting into that wellness and yeah, like, right. you know floral, flower, feminine, and feeling good, looking good. You know, and you, you know what? It, it all comes back to creating emotion, creating a feeling. Definitely, definitely. It? It's all about the feeling. It's yeah. all about the feeling. So, right, you got this. You got the store going. Um, your marketing is about foot traffic because I imagine do you, do you operate off fairly tight margins and and therefore don't have a lot of dough to dip into a marketing budget. Yeah, definitely, mm. definitely. Um, and that's where foot traffic is definitely key for us. Um, being in the right area where we get traffic where we get people coming into our store. I mean, we, we collect database. That's definitely one thing that from the beginning we've done and I highly recommend um, collecting collecting your clients' information. How? How? I've got, a, I've got, a, I've got a, a member of my forum who just posted yesterday. Um, he's got a store. It's a luggage store. There's, there's going to be a festival here, down the road from him on Sunday. He's expecting 70,000 people to walk past his shop and he's mm-hmm. asking one of the ideas is, well, collect email addresses, build a database. How? Yeah. Well, we, we use a system called Shopify. So what Shopify does, every time someone purchases something, we, we, we put all the details in the, in the system already. Now, the other thing is, is obviously there's all of those people that are passing by. Those 7,000 people that are passing by aren't always going to be your client. So I think for me the most important thing is connecting. You know, connecting with clients that actually want your product and getting their details. So I would rather have 100 ideal clients rather than 7,000 clients on my database that don't really, that are not really interested in my product. So for me, what we do first is about connecting. High service, how to get to know them, what are they about? And then once you connect, it's like they just want to know more about you and what your story is, what you're going to be offering. So that, that for me, having a genuine connection and just building a system that enables you to record their details. Okay. That's- so Shopify allows you to do that. that. That allows you to transact as well as capture contact details, build the list, yes. all that type of stuff, send emails yes. to them. But what, one of the things that, that what you just explained would make a lot of sense if you had a fixed retail presence. Um, you're yeah. there for a week, 
four weeks, you know, 12 weeks, and then you're gone and you might not be back in that area. So are, are pop-up customers loyal to you? Are they going to go across town? Um, well, we've, we've really, we've done a lot of Bayside pop-up. So we've, we've done a lot in the, in, in the same area. Um, so, and we've also had a lot of customers that, you know, that might come. I had one customer that she hasn't been in my store for 18 months, but she receives my emails. She's on my Instagram, but you know, she just pops in. It's like, oh, it's great to see you again. So they're always there. They're not, they maybe may not, may not come in every, every, every couple of months, but they're, they're, there's always a connection. So you build a list. You got a, what have you got a list of email addresses? Is that what you go for? Yeah, a list of the email, email is the most important thing. Um, we've started to take mobile, which we haven't actually, because we're, we're learning, we're still learning yeah. so much. But yeah, email is the most important one. Never stop learning, Nicolina. No. Hey, that'll be a very sad day. <laughs> yes, definitely. We're not growing if we don't learn. If we don't learn <laughs> hey, yeah, nice, so. nice. <laughs> not growing if we don't yeah. use that one. Just let me write yeah, that down. That's good. <laughs> so, um, I'll, let you, you ha- I'll let you have that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you you've got how, how big's your list, and and what do you do with it? Like, is it a monthly email, weekly email? Um, well, so in eighteen months, we've we've got we've got to about three thousand, and um, we do and we do um, at the moment it's monthly EDM, um, which is email um, email direct marketing. Um, which is basically updating our clients on you know what's new, what's happening, where where our new locations are. Um, but it's really we're working now. We're actually going to be working with um, someone that can actually show us how we can use, how we can actually add even more value to our clients and how we can use the database and what tools are the best tools to use. So again, there's still a lot there that we've got to learn. Have you do, do you? Retail your products online as well when you pop up because that would seem the obvious thing to do given you may have customers who aren't nearby and can't travel. It, it is and it's something that we're looking at. We have been focusing just on the stores Yep. because um, it's just such a big, it's been, you know, there's quite a lot involved. Um, so there's definitely an opportunity there and we are looking at that as an option. Now I want you to get, your, I want you to get your crystal ball out, Nicolina, and tell me what you think the future of retail is. High street retail. The future of retail. I think. I think online obviously plays a huge part to what's happening at the moment. But I, I think it's sort of gone from, I, it's gone from brick to more click. Now I think people are wanting to get back to a bit more brick <laughs> to actually touch and feel and experience mm-hmm. the product. So I actually think the retail component the actual brick retail component of um, of the industry is going to be more marketing. It's actually going to be more around another marketing touch point. So if you're – and, you know, the great thing about pop-ups is that you can do that. So even, you know, even stores like Toys R Us, which have got 600 retail stores, they pop up 80 stores around Christmas wow. all around the States because they know they can get – access to more people they can get you know they can it's it's just another catalog but it's actually a store yeah right and it and it also generates sales so um so i actually think that's where it's going like there's going to definitely be a lot of more touch and feel but it's not going to be necessarily always to drive sales it's always it's also going to be to you know you know Connect with more customers. Yeah, right. It's going to be it's going to be a marketing touch point. So whether it's a new new product range or a new line, we see a lot of pop up. When I say a lot of, actually, we don't see a lot of pop up stores. I mean, I think the bar's low. There's huge opportunity, and good on you for getting mm, in definitely. relatively early. Um, is it the ones we do see? I think I'm just kind of racking my brain here, but it's generally apparel. Uh, uh, you know, is is the pop up concept appropriate to any business that has a product to sell? Definitely, it definitely, definitely has. Why, why aren't we seeing more? I think, I think originally pop ups started to solve problems, um, and in apparel, there's always excess, there's, that there's always that's a traditionally um, an industry with excess stock, but now I think even like eBay and Etsy are seeing an, as an opportunity to get in front of more people and and, and run pop ups to you know connect with their clients. So I definitely think pop-ups are fantastic for you know, anywhere from homewares to even, 
to even like, who knows, like motorbike, uh, motorbikes and cars and, you know, imagine one day you're walking down the street and there's these awesome cafe races lined up out the front of, um, you know, a store in your favourite street. Like, it's, why I think not? It's, I think it's, it's, why not? And, and the great thing about it is, that, you know, we can give it a go. Um, and we can play with it. So, w- wacky question. Uh, what if you're a service provider? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the right service, and it all comes down to the client. What does your client want, mm. and where are they, and how? You know, is is that something that they're going to want? Are they actually going to want to walk into a, a space in in their street? I mean, look at what I guess. You know, if Apple did something and they said, "Well, listen, we're just going to offer this service, but we're going to help you download an app," and it's like you're going to want to go in there and nice. probably do that. Like that, yeah, yeah, you know, it, yeah. Good thinking. Yeah, so yeah. I think if it's the right, if it's the right service, and you know how to engage with your client, yeah, definitely. So, for example, uh, if you're a vet, uh, you could. Well, maybe it's a bad example because there's probably a whole lot of hygiene things going on there. But let's use it anyway. Uh, a vet, um, maybe um, at the start of spring, they could do a pop up in a main part of town where you could have your animal checked for five different things, no procedures done, but you were kind of in and out and it was a way for that vet to get exposure and that kind of makes sense to me. Yeah, I like that. Definitely. And I guess it's kind of like at an expo, you've got a lot of that happening and it's like there's no reason why that can't happen in a space. Like I've got a a few, I've got a friend in the UK who's doing pop-up of Botox. (laughs) So, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so it's like, why not? It's like, hey, let's just get a refill on your lunch break, you know? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, I think we're about to see an explosion at some point. And, and great, open the mind, figure out how to do it. Um, figure out how – the great question to ask anyone listening would be like, how could a pop-up concept apply to what – my business is all about. And whether you're an accountant or whether you're selling clothes or whatever, I'm sure there is a solution there. Hey, uh, yeah. Nicolina, love it. Thank you so much for sharing. Love your passion. Love the fact that you jumped off the cliff and you're building the parachute on the way down. <laughs> and, <Yes. laughs> and I reckon listeners will have some questions. Um, website address and if you're on Twitter, uh, what's your Twitter ID? Okay, so um, my website address is buildbrand.com.au. Um and my Twitter address is build brand slash pop up. Build um, brand you- slash pop up. Oh, I don't think that is yeah. a Twitter address. I am going to challenge you on that. I, f- I have. Well, yeah, I'll you buy might some, be right. I'll buy some time for you <laughs> while you figure out what it is because it's so funny how many guests when I do ask what their Twitter ID is, they kind of go, "Oh, geez, uh, yeah." Let me just have a think about that. If, if you go to if you go to my website. All of the details are there. I love it. I love it. I'll find it. I'll tell them. (laughs) Hey, uh, thanks so much, Nicolina Sarek, for sharing your popping experiences. And thank you so much for having me, Tim. It's been been awesome. Well, that was Nicolina Sarek, Melbourne's queen of pop-ups. And for your information, her Twitter ID is buildbrandpopup. All right? Hit her up on Twitter, tell her you heard her on the show, ask her a question or two. Now, I want to share my top three learnings from that fireside chat with Nicolina. And these learnings are brought to you by the good folk at keypersonofinfluence.com forward slash Timbo. You can get your free book over there or audibletrial.com forward slash SBBM. You can get another free book of your choice. Learning number one. Ask existing and potential clients what's the biggest problem they have right now. Or if you want to modify that question, ask them what the most expensive problem they have right now and then go about solving it. Learning number two, ask how your business could utilize pop-up stores, the pop-up store business model. You know, I did go into that interview thinking, yeah, really it's just for clothing brands, but it's not. I think there's a lot of businesses both Uh, product-based and service-based that could potentially do a pop-up store. And learning number three, build that email list and then communicate with it on a regular basis. We've talked about this before. And if you want to know how to communicate with it, head back to episode 131 where I interview email marketing expert Shane Tilley. I'll put a link in the show notes to this episode. Hey, and If you don't know what your audience want, your prospects want, ask. 
Nicolina was so good at asking. Maybe we'll make that learning number four. But you've got to ask because if you don't ask, you don't get. What did you learn from that little fireside chat with Nicolina? Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Look for episode 279 and I'd love to hear from you. I got some beautiful feedback earlier last month from a fellow by the name of Adam. He hasn't given me his business uh, address, so I'll just yeah, I'll just call him Adam. He says, hey, Timbo, I've been listening to your show since March of this year. Thank you, Adam. My initial reaction was, ah, an Aussie voice doing a podcast. This is going to be crap. <laughs> well, there's cultural cringe right there. But he says, boy, was I wrong. My business imports leather for the furniture, marine and automotive industries and we distributed our product throughout Australia, Asia and New Zealand. I've survived the GFC just, and wait for this team, at 45 I had a heart attack to prove it. I've always said that I don't, I don't do things by half. I've had some great ups in my business life with turning over $7.5 million only to watch it tumble at a great rate of knots. Wow. Wow. I was ready to quit, but I don't do quit, says Adam. Instead of feeling sorry for myself, I embarked on studying an MBA. (laughs) Why not? (laughs) And I'm now cranking out some great marketing, not only to get good marks, but to help my business grow once again. This Adam is, is a definition of a motivated business owner. He goes on to say, what keeps me up at night? Cash flow is the answer and also being worried about sales. But The funny thing is, the sales always seem to come. I experienced that as well. Do you? It's amazing. We worry about things and sure enough, they never materialise. Back to Adam, he says, we have a strong brand and are making it even stronger. Your podcast has been a true inspiration to me and I've learned so much, not only from you, but also from all your guests that you've interviewed. Brilliant, Adam. I just wanted to say thank you, Timbo. My journey is starting again with renewed enthusiasm. Cheers, Adam. Mate, as I have been heard to say before, that would bring a tear to a glass eye. Adam, thanks for sharing that. And, mate, you are an absolute inspiration. Thanks, buddy. Michelangelo once said, The greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that it is too low and we reach it. Oh, yes. Never a true a word spoken. Thank you, Michelangelo. That's one guy I would love to have met. Absolutely. I've, I finished his book about, about 12 months ago, The Agony and the Ecstasy, his bi- biography. Amazing. Amazing. Maybe it's on Audible. Have a look. Audibletrial.com forward slash SBBM. Maybe you can get it for free. Okay. Plenty of marketing gold coming your way In upcoming episodes, I chat with a third-generation family business owner who shares his three critical success factors for marketing. That's not why I'm laughing, this is. Plus, I have a chat with a lady whose breasts were too big for the bras available, so she started a bra shop with her mum. Yeah. Now, she's got three bra shops, and they're very successful. I've already been warned uh, not to be immature on the interview, but there will be a couple of gags along the way. You know, can't help myself. Hey, be sure to grab your hard copy of the Key Person of Influence Amazon bestseller over at keypersonofinfluence.com forward slash Timbo and a free audio book of your choice over at audibletrial.com forward slash SBBM. The sublime sounds of this show are produced by the great Daryl Misson. Thanks, Daz. My music bed created by all-round good guy, Lockie Dolly. Thanks, Lockie. If you want to surround yourself with other motivated business owners, then join the Small Business Big Marketing Forum over at crankmymarketing.com. And if you need a speaker for an upcoming event, I'm all yours, timreed.com.au. In fact, I'm off to speak at We Are Podcast on tomorrow at the on the Gold Coast. Until next week, I'm Timbo Reed. Always have been, always will be. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now.